Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, we're reading an Antiquity Unveiled. We're doing Apollonius, uh, picking up the uh, second part of Apollonius, and we're picking up on page 31 um, from the fourth paragraph. Um, so here it is Apollonius of TNS Spirit Testimony, uh, Antiquity Unveiled. Page 31, fourth paragraph. <clears throat> but in the last place, the historian would fain bid at something of his heroes appearing after death, yet he does it so faintly that in the conclusion of all it comes to nothing, especially when he tells us that the time of his death was altogether unknown, and that the uncertainty of it took no less than the compass of thirty years, and then that they that were so utterly at a loss as to the time of his decease, and that for so long a space, were very likely to give a very wise account of the certain time of anything that he did after it. But how, or to whom, did he appear? Why to a young man, one of his followers, that doubted of the immorality of the soul, of the immortality of the soul, for ten months together after his death? But how, or where, why the young man being tired with watching and praying to Apollonius that he would appear to him in this point, one day fell asleep in the school where the young men were forming several for forming their several exercises, and on a sudden he starts up in a great fight and a great sweat, crying out, "I believe thee, O oh, Tyanius." And being asked by his companions the meaning of his transport, why, says he, do you not see Apollonius? They answer him, no, but they would be glad to give all the world if they could. It is true, says he, for he only appears to me for my satisfaction, and he is invisible to all others. And then he tells them what he said to him in his sleep concerning the state of souls, this poor account of the dream and vision of an overwatched boy is all that this great story affords to vie with our Savior's resurrection. And now upon the review of this whole story, it seems evident to me that this man was so far from being endowed with any extraordinary divine power that he does not deserve the reputation of an ordinary conjurer. For though Huetus, H-U-E-T-I-U-S, has taken some pains to prove him so, yet he gives no evidence of it besides the opinion of the common people, and if that were enough to make a conjurer, there is no man of an odd and singular humor, parentheses, as Apollonius affected to be, who is not so thought of by the common people, and, therefore, when he was accused for it before Domiton, the emperor, upon coming to hear the cause, slighted both him and his accusers, and dismissed him from the court for an idle and fantastic fellow. And it is manifest from the whole series of his history that he was a very vain man and affected to be thought something extraordinary, and so wandered all the world in an odd garb to be gazed at and admired, and made himself considerable in that age by wit, impudence, and flattery, of all which he had a competent, sh all of which of all which he had a competent share, and for his wonder-working faculty which he needs pretend to, he fetched that as far off as the East Indies, that is, the farthest off, as he thought, from confutation, and yet the account which he has given of those parts is so grossly fabulous that that alone convicts his whole life of imposture and impudence. Such was the consternation produced by the translation of Philostratus, Life of Apollonius, into the modern tongues of Europe, that Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, seem to have cast discretion to the winds and have floundered into the bog from which it was their chief aim to escape. It will be seen that neither Dr. Robert Parker, Hewitt, nor Dr. Lardner, so much as dined, D-E-I-G-N-E-D, -E -E to notice the real and undeniable facts connected with the life and labors of Apollonius, but spent all their ingenuity in making the most of the fix 
fictions or exaggerated recitals, which were so common in accompaniment, in accompaniment of the ancient historical narratives, not one of which does not mingle the marvelous with the well-authenticated events which constitute the groundwork and object of all an object of all ancient historical records this avoidance of all notice of the philosophical and religious teachings of apollonius by those learned theologians shows as nothing else could their consciousness that apollonius was really the jesus paul and john of the new testament scriptures we have shown that apollonius for several years taught and preached at antioch and converted many who were strangers to his knowledge, to a belief in his doctrines. It was owing to his great renown as a spiritual medium and teacher acquired at Antioch that certain Jews who had become acquainted with his gifts as a medium and the remarkable manifestations of spirit power occurring through him prevailed upon him to go to Jerusalem. This visit, he tells us, he made to Jerusalem when he was just 33 years of age, the very age at which it has been alleged that Jesus began his heaven-appointed mission. He tells us he was then hailed upon his entrance into that city by the people, as it has been alleged the entrance of Jesus of Nazareth was hailed, with hosannas and songs of praise to one who came in the name of the Lord. He refers no doubt to the following portion of the 11th Matthew 9, and the multitude that we went before, or quotes, and the multitude that went before, and that followed, cried, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. End of quote. It is true that Apollonius says nothing of his experience at the hands of the Jewish priesthood, and we are left to infer that their treatment of him was less agreeable to him than his reception by the multitude. It is true that there is no historical mention extant of, of this visit of Apollonius to Jerusalem, and therefore we may justly conclude that the writer of the Gospel according to Matthew, after making use of such a historical manuscript to serve his purpose of robbing Apollonius of his duty, acquired fame by substituting the mythical Jesus in his stead, took special care to destroy the historical original. That Apollonius never returned to Jerusalem until he did so 32 years afterward, as the oracle in Vespian's camp at the overthrow of Jerusalem would indicate that the usage he had received at the hands of the Jewish priesthood on the first visit, on the first visit, was such as to deter him from again placing himself in their power. As strong evidence of the correctness of this conjecture, it is well to note that Judea was the only civilized country that Apollonius did not visit, and throughout which he did not preach, and in which he did not receive the fraternal reception of every order of priesthood. That Damis made no record of this visit of Apollonius to Jerusalem may be reasonably accounted for by the facts that it was made before Damis began his memoirs, and in all probability Apollonius was too much disgusted with the narrow bigotry of the Jewish hierarchy to inform Damis about it. Apollonius has not told us what followed his joyous reception by the people of Jerusalem. The writers who have made use of that event to extol their mythical man God say, regarding to the latter, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he, left, and he left them, and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. How much of that, that is taken from the historical memoirs of Apollonius, we may not certainly know, but nothing is more thoroughly authenticated than the fact that Apollonius was a wonderful healing medium, that he restored sight to the blind, strength to the lame, health to the sick, life to those apparently dead, and prophesied with an accuracy that astonished the then-civilized world.
that he did all these things at Jerusalem is most probable, if not certain. And thus, through the return of the spirit of Apollonius, we have a chapter of history revived that the writers of the Christian scriptures supposed they had entirely obliterated from its records. And that was Apollonius of Tyana, Tiana, Antiquity Unveiled, up to page 35.